Hello friend and welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is the first video that you've ever seen of mine, I want to let you know in advance that I'm not a gear channel. I don't want to be. And if it feels like that's what I'm trying for, then I might be coming across incorrectly. I want to help you make meaningful and beautiful films. And ultimately I want to make meaningful and beautiful films. So in this video, it is a review of the Fuji X-T4, but I'm reviewing it only as a means to making meaningful and beautiful films. So I will mostly be telling you about my user experience so far, and I try to avoid all of the uh, technical stuff and the spec sheet because there are lots of other reviewers who do a great job with that. So I recommend you go watch those reviews I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about my relationship with the camera and my experiences so far. If you're not interested in watching the full length of this video, which is totally fine, then my review is basically this. The camera is amazing for the price, the functionality and the specs and the usability that it offers are in my opinion, unmatched uh, when it comes to a hybrid camera. Now, if you're looking for a cinema camera, you can get the Blackmagic Pocket 4K or 6K or the GH5S for a really similar price point, but you won't be getting a hybrid camera and there are some other features that you're missing out on. Uh, and if you aren't concerned about budget, then we all know right now how exciting the camera world is and the fact that the A7S III and the R5 and the R6 and the Panasonic S1H are all incredible options. So this camera really fits into a nice and unique spot in my opinion. Um, the closest competitor I would think of is the A7 III if you're looking for a price and feature comparison. And for me, the spec sheet and the usability and the user experience has been better than with my a7 III that I used to own. So yeah, that's my quick review. And now let's dive into a little bit of the specifics. I'm going to try and address all of the big topics right off the bat. And I'm going to do my best to keep this as brief as possible and try and show you real world footage. Uh, but if you haven't watched any of the videos I have shot or made using the X-T4, I think that's the best way to see what this camera can do. I've put out four or five videos so far with the X-T4, so I'll link those below or in the pinned comment, but I definitely would recommend that you watch those. The most comprehensive would be the Tucson Super Mega Vlog that I made. We road tripped from Kansas City to Tucson, and it's a 40 minute vlog. And I tried to leave the camera as unpolished as possible. I tried to put it in its best light without overdoing it. And so you'll see the IBIS in there. You'll see the color science. You'll see 4K 60. Um, I did not do much 240, but yeah, otherwise that is a great test to go see what the camera actually performs like in real world scenarios. But I've also put it through some professional scenarios so you can go watch those and you'll continue to see X-T4 videos coming out from me. So yeah, stay tuned, but I'm gonna try and hit all of the big deals, the big items on the review list quickly, but thoroughly. IBIS is the first item on my list. And my quick review is that it really helps, and especially with unstabilized lenses, like the Sigma 18 to 35, which is my favorite lens. It lives on my camera all the time. So if you're curious about any perspectives that I have on IBIS or autofocus or you name it, I'm using the Sigma 18 to 35. So take that for granted, assume that. Um, and if it's not that lens, then it's the Fuji 18 to 55 kit lens. So yeah, that's where I'm coming from in my review, but the IBIS has been really good for re removing the micro jitters and for helping to make a lens that is unstabilized, very usable um, in almost any scenario. Now, the IBIS doesn't work miracles. That's what I think the caveat has to be. Um, 
is that you're not able to do whatever you want just because you have IBIS. If you're trying to walk or vlog and you want to jerk the camera around or move it too much, it's going to get wobbly, especially at wider angles. And it's just not made for that kind of movement. Um, I would say that the IBIS is really good for tripod or monopod style shooting. And it is good for uh, simple movement, panning, um, you know, really small movements, um, dynamic stuff. But then for walking, vlogging, and for, you know, more heavy movement, you have to be careful still because it's, it's not a, a miracle hardware or software or whatever. It, it still has to be treated carefully. And so what I've done, and this is kind of my theory behind photo, video in general, but especially with cameras that I'm buying that are hybrid cameras using them for filmmaking, I try my best to learn the limitations and I get really good at imitating where it doesn't work well. Where are those limitations? Because then what I do is I avoid them. So I have learned with this camera, with the IBIS, as it is right now in the firmware 1.03, I think is the update we're on. I try not to use the IBIS in situations uh, wider than 24 millimeters or 36 full frame equivalent and when there is not a clear subject. Now, if I'm wider than 24 millimeters and there is a clear subject in frame, it seems to be able to track based on that subject. Now, if I'm wider than that and there is no subject, it feels like it's, it's trying to find something to stabilize based on and it warps pretty bad. But as soon as I get past 24, I haven't noticed any problems. Um, it's been incredibly reliable for me. And um, I would say I have an average or a steady hand. So that might make a difference for you. A weird little factor that is helpful for me too is that I export my videos at 2.4 to 1 aspect ratios. So I like the cinematic bars, you know, I, I export without the bars, but I like that and stylistically that's one side of it, but I'm actually finding that it helps to crop off the corners where that ibis wobble sometimes happens. So in my wedding films you really will never see the ibis wobble I don't think because the wobble typically happens in the corners of the frame and with the 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, uh, they're not really noticeable. Now, I do 16 by 9 aspect ratios for vlogs or personal videos and you can watch those and I still don't think that the IBIS is um, bad, but yeah, that's, that's another little silly consideration. The last small quirk before I move on from IBIS is the IBIS and OIS cannot be separated. So if you have a native lens with OIS, I haven't tested this with non-native lenses, but if you have a native lens with OIS, you don't get to pick OIS or IBIS. You have to use both. It just turns them both on and off. So that's something to think about. Now, when it comes to the autofocus, this is one of the bigger topics as well, right next to IBIS. And I feel like Fuji has been getting trashed a little bit for the autofocus, but in my opinion, Fuji is competitive with Sony and Canon um, and comes in you know, just a notch below, which is still really good. And as a wedding shooter, in the type of work that I'm doing, you can't really screw up your focus because every moment happens only one time. And so for me, I trust the autofocus on the X-T4, but I say that with the caveat that the X-T4 autofocus, much like the X-T3 in my experience, is incredibly subjective based on the lens. So the 18 to 35 from Sigma that I'm using has had incredibly consistent and safe autofocus performance. And I hope it's not jittering on the background because that would be kind of embarrassing. But for me, it's been steady and it's been safe and consistent for weddings um, and for vlogging. And again, go watch the videos. You can see me using autofocus about 80 to 90% of the time. So I trust it. I found that it's really good. 
Um, reliability and speed have not been my issue. Uh, it's actually the, the jitter or the jumpiness, which is the speed. It, it's really fast um, and it's, in my experience, it's really accurate, but it can at times be too quick. Um, and I've got my settings uh, arranged in a way where it feels really organic. Um, but it still does do the jump sometimes. But if I'm shooting in 4K60 and I'm slowing that autofocus movement down, then I still feel really good about it. But all in all, I would recommend that if you're looking for smooth focus racks, then I would tell you probably just switch to manual focus because it's probably not there yet. Again, before I move on from autofocus, I can't emphasize enough that with Fuji, it appears to be incredibly subjective based on the lens that you're using. And very few of Fuji lenses are new enough to have autofocus motors oriented towards video shooters. So the kit 18 to 55 feels like it works well. I have seen the 16 to 80 mil uh, F4 working well on other videos and I think that's probably, those are probably two of the better ones. The 16 to 55 F2.8, I also think works well as far as I've seen. Um, but most of their primes that are faster, I just think that they're primarily photo lenses. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the autofocus deal. I would tell you to just try it for yourself um, and, and beware as you buy lenses, which ones are older and, and which ones are gonna work better for video continuous autofocus. But otherwise, my quick review would be the face tracking works well, unless you get probably 10 plus feet away. Um, but I'm content with the face tracking and all other things considered, I'm happy with the autofocus. It's not perfect. I think Sony and Canon are better, but it's really usable and I trust it. This one I'm just going to touch on really quickly but I have not experienced overheating yet. I have shot out in Palm Springs, uh, in Joshua Tree. I've shot here in Kansas in 100 degrees Fahrenheit during a nine hour wedding day, and I haven't experienced overheating yet. I don't shoot long clips of 4K60 usually, um, but yeah, I haven't experienced overheating. I can't even remember if I've gotten the temperature warning, but if I have, I usually just switch the battery. And yeah, on every camera system I've had, I switch the battery. I try and make sure I'm doing my part in keeping the camera cool. So I don't know if I can get on board with everyone else who is saying that it has overheating issues, but you know, again, try it for yourself, figure out the situation that you're going to be working in. If you're gonna be in the desert, and it's gonna be really hot, or if you're gonna be in high humidity, you know, 100 degree plus Fahrenheit situations, you know, maybe this isn't the camera for you, I'm not sure, but in my experience, I've yet to have problems with it. As for the flippy screen, I think I am one of the most neutral people on the internet when it comes to this topic. Uh, I see the downsides of the fact that it gets in the way of my uh, side ports with the HDMI, the audio cable and everything, but, um, and, and I like the durability of a standard rotating or articulating display, but not the fully flippy one. And so I probably fall somewhere in the middle. I like being able to monitor myself and not have to pay for a monitor, but I'm probably pretty neutral when it comes to the flip screen. The screen is good though. I really like the screen. Uh, it's visible in daylight right now is almost full sun and it's visible. So I like that, but I'm probably not the best person to ask. I'm pretty neutral. I liked the X-T3 screen and I like this screen. Now for the battery, this is one of the biggest perks about the camera. Um, with the caveat that I like to charge my cameras while they're recording via USB-C. So the X-T3 and the X-T4, I really don't feel the battery life all that drastically improved because I charge them while I shoot. 
But if you're not someone that does that, or like me, where sometimes I just prefer the freedom of, you know, taking the camera out and not having to think about a cable, um, or rigging up your camera, like mine isn't rigged, um, then the xt 4s battery is twice as powerful. I think the last one was a 1000 milliamp hour, and this one is a 2000 milliamp hour. Um, so yeah, it's good. And I have some third party batteries that come with the dual charger, which is pretty clutch. And that's been awesome for me. So yeah, overall, uh, the battery life is awesome. I have shot a nine hour wedding day um, and multiple six hour days. And uh, on the six hour days, I use like one and a half. And on the nine hour days, I've used like two, two and a half and yeah, but it's never something that I've worried about. So that's really nice because the X-T3, I definitely had in the back of my mind all the time, what's my battery at? Do I have to swap it? Like, should I keep charging it? So that's something you have to think about, which is a bummer, but I still think that it's a, it's a good battery um, and I'm glad for the improvement. Now for the stills and movie switch. This was a big change from the X-T3 and this is a relatively minor change for me, but I actually, I think when I, when I pause for a moment, it is a big deal and it's really helpful because having the menus separated, having the function buttons separated is huge. I just love so much that I have now on my movie dial all of the options for video and only for video because I don't dive into photo that often. And so I just really don't need to dig through all the photo options when I am only shooting video. So this is a huge thing for me. Uh, I didn't think it would be a big deal and I still have a hard time saying why it is a big deal, but it's really convenient. So yeah, put that on the list of pros. Now here's another one that seems like a small deal uh, until you realize it's a big deal and really helpful and that is F-Log View Assist. So this is a built-in Fuji LUT. I think it's just F-Log Direct 709. And so that way when you're recording F-Log, like I am right now, um, then you can view on the back of your Fuji screen what it will look like as Rec. 709 footage. So that way you get all the perks of F-Log footage, but you get the viewing benefits and I think the autofocus benefits of Rec. 709. Because, and I really don't think I'm crazy on this, but I believe that the Fuji system being contrast based benefits from the built-in display LUT. So when you are shooting in F-Log, and you don't have the display assist on, I believe in my experience that the autofocus does not work as well. Comparatively, when you have it, the view assist on, the autofocus works pretty much like it does in every other mode. So again, this is a small feature, but it helps in a big way. And I don't shoot F-Log by default. I don't spend most of my time shooting F-Log. I prefer classic Chrome and I've made videos about that, but I enjoy shooting in F-Log and I'm moving towards that uh, as being my main profile. So yeah, this is a great feature that they added. I hope they add this to the X-T3 because I still own the X-T3 and it would be really convenient to have it available on both cameras. Next is the dual card recording, and is a this is a really simple one to go over. It used to be on the X-T3 that you could only record to one of the two card slots in video mode, and now you can record to both card slots simultaneously, which as a wedding shooter is incredibly important. In fact, I bought the Ninja 5 primarily for that purpose when I was shooting with the X-T3, and now that I own the X-T4, I have sold the Ninja 5 because I have dual recording in my cards so that when I leave a wedding day, I can have perfect peace of mind. And I, again, I hope that this one comes to the X-T3 in a firmware update, just like the F-Log View Assist.
For the size and the ergonomics, I, I think it's a noticeable improvement over the X-T3, but both were comfortable to hold and to me it doesn't make a huge difference because I typically put a grip, a metal grip, or I put a cage on the camera. So I don't notice a huge improvement in the ergonomics, but the X-T4 does have a bigger body to fit the battery and the IBIS, and I do prefer to have that bigger body um, for the trade-off of a little bit of weight. So yeah, the ergonomics and the size, a little bigger, a little better, but not a huge difference from the X-T3, and not as good as other cameras on the market today, like the a7 III or the GH5S or R5, R6, because it is smaller, um, but yeah. Now for the low light performance, this one is tough because I have found that low light performance feels objective. It feels like you can just point at noise and say, that's where it gets noisy. That means it's a bad image and that's what you should avoid. But for me, uh, I found that I'm okay with Fuji's grain, uh, Fuji's noise grain, uh, because it looks like film grain instead of like digital noise. And so I've found that up to ISO 6400, I feel really comfortable using that footage, no questions asked. And then at ISO 8000, I like the grain. I like that Fuji looks like it has film grain instead of digital noise. But then at 12,800, the noise starts to deteriorate the image quality. And so having DaVinci Resolve, um, the studio version for 300 bucks, I use the denoiser inside of um, the temporal noise reduction for uh, DaVinci Resolve and it cleans up 12,800 footage really well. So uh, I think I have some footage um, at each of those ISOs and if not I'll try and get some test footage in here for you. But yeah, this is not the low light king. It's an APS-C sensor. Um, I would tell you to get a fast lens and f1.8 and I think you'll be fine. Um, I've shot it in plenty of dancing scenarios at weddings. I've shot it well after sunset outdoors and yeah, at twilight with the moon and everything. And I feel good about those images. So yeah, the low light performance, it's not the king, but to me, it does a good job. And Fuji is really awesome because the film grain or because the noise looks like film grain instead of looking like digital noise. Now for the video file types, the options, the record limitations, the performance, and the storage sizes, um, I would tell you just refer to a spec sheet on this or um, a technical review like Gerald Undone's. Uh, the point is, is that Fuji has a ton of different options. So you can shoot from 8-bit, 100 to 400 megabits in 4K, or you can drop down to HD if you need less uh, smaller file sizes to take up less storage and you can also switch into 10-bit um, and get H.265 files which are a bit harder on your editing software or editing system but you do get 10-bit color and you can shoot that between 100 and 400 megabits per second and I just love the flexibility and the file types and the options and the camera does still have record limits uh, 19 minutes I think in 4k 60 and 29 minutes in 4k 24 and 30 but again go look at a spec sheet for those for me they haven't been a big deal I am rarely recording over those time limits um, and especially not without two cameras operating now when it comes to the audio preamps this one is hard for me to review the audio preamps are a camera's preamps so they're good they're not great they'll get you usable ambient footage and they'll work in a pinch if you need audio but i would tell you to put on a mic um, or to mic your subject and uh, boom if you have to um, boom into a recorder but um, i have boomed straight into the camera and it works but they're camera preamps so they're good not great Now from an overall usability, user-friendliness, 
quick function buttons, that sort of thing. I love this camera. I have used Sony cameras and I, my wife uses Canon cameras. And when it comes to Fuji, I feel like it's just the perfect blend. I feel like the menus are accessible and they're usable. Um, they're not overwhelming, especially not with the stills and movie dial being separated. And the quick function buttons, it may not have a lot of real estate on the body for the quick functions, but I still find that between the quick function menu and between the buttons on body and the my menu that I'm perfectly set when it comes to usability. There's not a single setting um, that I have had trouble accessing when I really want to or when I need to change a setting fast in a pinch. So from a user friendly perspective, I think it's an incredible camera. Um, yeah, it's just one of my favorites. Lens options. When it comes to lens options, Fuji is not great. They don't have a ton of lenses, um, but, and they don't have a ton of third party lenses, but I know that Sigma is starting to produce lenses according to Fuji rumors. Um, and I also know that with the Fringer Pro 2 adapter and with the new Metabones EF to FX, as well as the standard, the speed booster, as well as the standard adapter, I think that the whole world of EF glass is open to Fuji users. So for me, I use the 18 to 35 and I'm really anxious to try the Metabone speed booster with a 24 to 70 on this camera because I think that would be amazing. But yeah, the lens selection is not perfect from Fuji, but with those adapters, I think that you've got a ton of options available for you. Now, when it comes to the actual image quality itself, I will say that it's pretty subjective. I personally find that Fuji has the best color science available today. And I do think that that's my opinion. I don't think everybody has to agree with me, but if you've seen Fuji's colors or if you've watched a dozen reviews, you know that people love them. And I think they're so flexible and combining the color straight out of the camera with the capabilities that the camera can output like 10 bit um, and the robust 400 megabit or 200 megabit files, you have a ton of flexibility in post. And so I think that the color is unmatched in my opinion, but I know that in the more expensive categories, you've got raw and in uh, Canon, you've got great color science and Sony's getting better. So I know that that's very subjective, but I love it. and. There is a new profile called Classic Neg, which I think is so beautiful. My favorite is still Classic Chrome. I still uh, use F-Log, um, which is a great log profile. And I don't use it a ton, but I love when I get to use it because it's so um, friendly for color grading. It's, it's not too flat and the image holds up really well with 10 bit, 200 megabits and above. And so, I think it's really awesome. I love Fuji's colors and that's a perfect transition to the dynamic range. Now, I think that there can be, you know, all of the DxO mark tests. I think that's the name of it. Um, and I think that you can get a lot of information on a spec sheet, but when it comes to using a camera and the dynamic range that it offers, I think that it's, incredibly important to actually put it in your hands and to try it out. And having used the X-T3 and now the X-T4 for a while, I just love Fuji's dynamic range. In my experience, uh, whether it's an 8-bit or in 10-bit and between 100 and 400 megabits, it's just a really robust dynamic range. I don't know how to explain it. Um, I wish that I could prove it on paper but in my experience, it's just been incredibly beautiful. And more than anything else, when it comes to the dynamic range, is the value of the highlight roll off. I, I don't like the video look of highlights. And if you know what I'm talking about, then you know, and if you don't, I, unfortunately I can't explain it, um, but I think there are videos out there about this. And the dynamic range the, with the Fuji has the highlight roll off so smooth that I think it looks filmic 
And that's really impressive to me in a camera that's under $2,000. Um, and it's not a cinema camera, it's a hybrid camera. So I love the dynamic range. It's been incredibly helpful for me in shooting in situations that are um, ridiculous, you know, where you've got uh, direct sunlight shining onto a bride's white dress and you've got a groom wearing a black or a navy suit, which is really dark. And so situations like that make a dynamic range of, you know, the X-T4 with the highlight roll-off really valuable. But again, that's subjective, just like the colors for me. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that that helps in some way. All right, now I'm gonna wrap up the video with the value. Um, I think that this will be my final point. I might include a few little nitpicks or, or other points of information, but the value for me is one of the most important parts of any camera, but especially the Fuji X-T3 and 4. And when you look at the price point, you're looking at cameras like Blackmagic Pocket, GH5, or the a7 III or other cameras from Sony. And if I'm evaluating the video features and the stills capability and the fact that it is a user-friendly camera in a hybrid body and form factor and that you don't have to build it up too much um, to use it at all of those incredible specs that it offers, I just feel like this is the best camera at the price point for the time being. And if budget isn't an option, if budget isn't a requirement for you, then by all means, the A7S III and the R5, R6, S1H might be better choices. But for now, in the under $2,000 price bracket, I find it difficult to beat the X-T4. And again, this is subjective, but I really believe that there aren't any other cameras offering what the X-T4 is offering for the price. Now, when it comes to this camera, I am becoming more and more familiar with Fuji. And so, as you might imagine, there are little things that I love and there are little things that I hate. Um, I can't get over the colors. Shooting with Fuji for a long time, I just love it so much. I love the aesthetic. I love the way that the camera feels and holds and looks. Um, even though I never use the top dials, I like having them. It's a fun look. Um, and even if it's not functional for me, but yeah, there are little things that I love so much. And then there are little things that I hate, like the fact that they got rid of the removable side door um, for the ports and put it on the SD cards. And then the battery door on the bottom can't open all the way to get a battery out if I have a tripod plate on there. And so there are little things like this that I love and I hate. And I think that's just developing a relationship with the camera um, or with anything. You just get used to some things, some things come to bother you and you're used to others. So yeah, I, I've got a lot of those I think, but who doesn't? Um, from a subjective, completely my opinion perspective, I love this camera. I highly recommend it. I think that it's an incredible value. I think that it's probably one of the best cameras available today. Um, and I hope that you found this review helpful. And if you have any questions, as always, please leave them down below. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. I want to help in any way that I can. I don't make these videos for my own gain or glory or whatever. I, I just want to be able to help somebody out. So yeah, leave me a comment, introduce yourself, say hello, and keep an eye out for future videos coming because one exciting one is this lens, the anamorphic Siru lens. Uh, I'm excited to review it. So yeah, keep, uh, keep staying around, watching videos. I'd appreciate it. And I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.